should we start? Sure. Okay. Okay, uh, welcome everybody to the seminar organized by the Center for Comparative and Public Law. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Carrie Riddick, who teaches at the University of Toronto. She's a professor of law, women and gender studies, and public policy and governance. Um, she's engaged in a lot of really fascinating research areas, um, and we're really lucky that she, I think she's chosen a particularly interesting topic for the, um, her presentation today on international labor law. Um, and we were talking at lunch about how little people actually know <laughs> about, I mean, including myself, about international labor law um, and the intersection with domestic law in many, uh, in a variety of ways. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand the floor over to, to Carrie. Um, and, and please join me in welcoming her. Thank you very much, um, Kelly. Um, for the invitation to come and speak with all of you. Thanks to all of you for coming on a Friday afternoon. Um, um, and in general, to the law school for being uh, such wonderful, hospitable hosts uh, uh, while I'm here. Um, so the subject of international labor law immediately conjures up particular images in people's mind. Uh, factory fires, child labor, um, violence against union organizers, uh, pregnancy testing of factory workers, and so forth. Um, and confronted with these sorts of problems and violations, the task of international labor law is typically figured as solving the conjoined problems of agreement and enforcement. So put simply, uh, it involves establishing baseline rights at work, um, and ensuring that all states respect them and that um, uh, 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 firms and employers adhere to them. What I'm going to do today is complicate this story about international labor law uh, because this is only uh, a part of the story. Um, international labor law now um, looks considerably more complex. Um, uh, there are many, many challenges to the basic mission of international labor law coming from a variety of different places. Um, there are a whole bunch of new modes of establishing norms at work beyond the state. Um, and uh, uh, as a result, there are all kinds of actors and institutions involved in international labor law broadly understood. Um, um, and behind the story of all these workers' rights violations is really the story of a field in crisis. Um, uh, and labor laws in crisis, particularly at the international level, although it's not, frankly, doing very well at the domestic level in very many countries either. Um, uh, why, why is this? Um, I'm going to sketch this out for you because, as Kelly said, um, almost uh, no audience knows a great deal about um, international labor law in detail, so I think it's probably worth just setting out a little bit of the background. So I'll do that. Um, so labor law as we know it um, emerged at a particular time and place. So it's very closely connected to um, uh, a particular form of work, the standard employment relationship that predominated at a particular historical moment, um, namely the 20th century and in a particular geographic region, uh, the North Atlantic and later the North Pacific world. Um, uh, it's also a product of a particular political economy and a particular world of production. And that, roughly speaking, is one uh, dominated by, you know, almost defined by territorially bounded industrial production. Um, it's worth saying that international, or excuse me, labor law, um, uh, um, as originally conceived, operated within a Westphalian world. Um, some of you um, may be familiar with this term already, but it's a shorthand way of referring to the assumption that we operate in a world of states um, that effectively control and regulate the social and economic activity within their territorial boundaries. So this is, this is the world out of which labor law um, uh, emerged. And as fate would have it, um, uh, uh, this world is really passing away. Um, um, and as we're discovering, many, uh, although by no means all, of the norms and structures of labor law 
are quite badly suited uh, to managing the problems of work in the new economy. And uh, sometimes it's a struggle for labor lawyers to even locate particular problems of work within their discipline at all. And this is particularly true when it comes to forms of work that predominate in developing countries and in the global south. Um, uh, uh, so what I'm going to do is speak to a paper that I actually delivered to an audience of uh, labor law scholars and activists and students and professionals, practitioners um, in Canada um, a little while ago. Um, um, and what I want to do is give you a little bit of a sense of where international law has been in the last while, what its institutions look like, uh, what its preoccupations have been, um, where its successes and failures are, um, and uh, what the challenges are going forward, who's running the agenda, and why um, uh, the agenda for labor market governance and workers' rights is being pulled in so many directions. Um, uh, the central impulse um, behind this paper is really uh, uh, pretty basic, and it's to suggest that whatever its past was, the future of international labor law is going to look quite different. In fact, it has to look quite different than it has in the past if it's going to remain relevant at all. Um, and one reason is that forms of work that have been um, uh, marginal to labor law in the past are now front and central when it comes to problems at work. Um, think about informal work, for example. Um, this is something that has uh, been almost entirely left aside um, uh, uh, within the field of labor law, but in fact, in many countries, um, uh, informal work dominates the world of work. It is what most people do. Um, the second, um, the second thing I would observe is that, as everybody in this room knows, uh, we no longer are operating in a world of territorially bounded production. Um, uh, work economic activity traverses borders. Um, and for that reason, and I think really this is a gateway into a whole nested, interesting set of problems that should be a big part of the research agenda of labor law lawyers in the future. Um, uh, the conditions under which workers labor, um, uh, questions of workers' rights, are neither under the control of, nor are they arguably the responsibility of any single state anymore, right? Uh, instead, they implicate um, the <coughs> actions of many, many different people and the legal systems of different jurisdictions. That's one of the consequences um, uh, uh, um, uh, when you start to organize production across borders. Um, the third thing uh, that I would note is that the whole project of protecting workers' rights is a concern that's dropped down the regulatory agenda um, uh, of most states. It doesn't rank very highly in most states' concerns. Um, and it's certainly um, the poor cousin at the international level as well. Okay, and the basic, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, one basic reason, uh, at least when it comes to the relative disinterest on the part of states, and here I'm going to include the industrialized as, uh, as well as the developing world and, and every state that stands somewhere in between. It's the fear, um, uh, one that uh, um, has some basis in reality, but much less than people think, that protecting workers' rights puts their position in the competition for investment for capital at risk, right? Um, uh, now, I guess before I dig in a little bit, I, w I, I feel like emphasizing, especially in this audience, um, that these are problems that every country is dealing with uh, right now. No country has successfully come to grips with what these big changes mean for the regulation of work. Um, uh, uh, what it means for their employment law and policy. Um, um, at the same time, every country needs to be interested in these issues, even if they haven't yet come to grips with them. Um, and the reason is very, very simple. Um, the conditions under which people work are inseparable from basic questions of welfare in any society. Um, and uh, every country, whatever its concerns are, at the end of the day, has a basic interest in ensuring that its population works under relatively safe conditions, um, that people make enough income 
uh, to sustain at least a basic standard of living and hopefully to do more than that. Um, um, uh, all kinds of problems um, uh, spill out from work, which become public policy crises um, in a variety of different areas if workplace conditions um, uh, get eroded or collapse. So work stands at the center of a whole public policy agenda, um, uh, which is why even though part of the story that I'm going to tell is a story of um, pressure on labor law in the first instance, um, uh, there's no question in my mind that um, uh, rights at work, protections at work, and the status of workers are issues that will remain central to um, the uh, political and policy agenda in the longer term. All right, so here's what I'm going to try and do, and I suspect I'll have to crop this a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the ILO and the character of international labor law, um, and then describe um, uh, a movement towards the transnational governance of work, which is how I would describe what the field looks like right now. Um, um, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the transformations in law and the economy that are driving this, uh, uh, these changes. Um, and then I want to talk and probably put on the agenda pretty centrally the problem of fragmentation, um, which uh, we can understand in shorthand as um, uh, regime competition, competition um, and conflict uh, when it comes to uh, norms and rights at work. Um, um, and I'm going to then talk a little bit about um, some cases um, involving trade and labor rights, some at the international level and some within the European Union. Um, and then, uh, uh, depending on how we're going at the end, um, uh, uh, say something a little bit more about um, the broader sources of fragmentation in labor rights and norms. Um, that are coming out of um, competing labor market uh, governance agendas elsewhere in the international order, as well as um, the public-private initiatives that are underway. Okay. All right. So, um, the ILO. The International Labor Organization is, in fact, the oldest international organization in the world. It was born, uh, uh, created, um, at the Peace of Versailles at the end of the First World War um, uh, in an effort to establish um, uh, baseline standards um, uh, concerning just and fair work. Um, I would say that two main impulses animated the creation of the ILO. The first was simply um, that um, uh, uh, a consensus among states that the absence of social justice um, was and remains a threat to international peace and security. So it wasn't just a nice thing to have, but its absence would predictably spill over into social conflict and, in fact, military conflict. Uh, uh, the second thing driving the emergence of international labor law was, however, developments at the domestic level, uh, particularly within industrialized states, um, uh, um, the rise of the social state, um, starting with um, Bismarck's Germany um, uh, and spreading to many other states in Europe. States were already um, uh, engaged in regulating labor standards at the domestic level um, as part of just dealing with the problems of populations that were very rapidly um, um, urbanizing and industrializing. So think of this as the moment when people start moving from the countryside to the city, city and more and more people are engaged in waged work um, of an industrial character. Okay, um, the refoundation of the ILO after the Second World War um, and the restatement of its mission then was part of a larger set of changes on the international landscape um, uh, what international uh, uh, relations scholar John Ruggie, who's also famous for the Ruggie principles on business and human rights, um, has called the embedded liberal bargain. Um, uh, it's something that you may have heard about before, but I think it's critical to understanding the purpose of international labor law in the post-war era. Uh, and this is simply the idea or the recognition that the commitment to liberalized trade, which was part of the post-war order um, uh, uh, couldn't succeed um, without a robust domestic counterpart. 
uh, namely, um, liber everybody understood that liberalized trade would have profoundly destabilizing if internal effects. Some people would lose their jobs, entire industries would die, uh, um, or were at risk of dying. Um, the whole project of liberalizing trade is not going to work unless every country also commits to instituting social policies, monetary policies, fiscal policies, and as it turns out, labor law policies that don't just let the losses lie where they fall, but instead um, uh, uh, cushion people to some extent from economic disruptions which are entirely out of their control. And labor law performed uh, uh, a big part of this function and the ILO uh, played a central role in domestic states' capacity to perform this role. So um, they were involved in drafting conventions on particular labor standards, but also in uh, providing technical assistance to states in setting up um, social welfare schemes and so forth. Okay, we could talk a lot more about that, um, but I'm not going to talk more about that. Um, uh, I, the only thing I was going to say, and I, this too is worth hanging on to, is that it was always understood that labor standards um, would be implemented differently and would ultimately take different form in different countries, right? So there was no expectation um, that labor standards themselves would be identical. There are a million reasons why that wasn't a viable proposition. Um, so states have always had a large um, uh, uh, margin of appreciation, as the term is in Europe, uh, to craft labor standards that are suitable and responsive to their own uh, systems of production, their own industrial relations systems. Um, we, sh we should, we do um, expect that labor law will look different in different places. I think that's worth bearing, bearing in mind. Okay, so we're quite a long distance away from this world now at the descriptive level, at the normative level, and at the analytic level. Um, um, and before going further on this one, I want to make a couple of observations about international labor law. Um, and they're a little bit contradictory, um, but I think it's helpful to keep them both in mind as we think about international labor law. And the first one that is that labor law has always been international. Um, uh, that is, there's a really deep insight um, at the heart of international labor law, and it's one that remains as valid now as it did when, uh, uh, when the ILO was founded. And that's simply that labor standards have cross-border effects. Whatever you do or don't do in one country is going to have knock-on effects in another country. Um, um, this is why uh, the preamble to the ILO Constitution uh, includes the observation that the failure of any nation to adopt humane conditions of labor is an obstacle in the way of other nations which desire to improve their conditions, uh, their labor conditions. Okay, so, um, so this is the sense in which labor law has always been international. It's a, it's a it, we're all in this together. We can't do it on our own countries, have to keep an eye on what's going on in other places. Okay, so that's the sense in which labor law has always been international and remains international. Now I'm going to say the, something that rose in the opposite direction. Um, when the ILO was created, and for a very long time afterwards, and arguably still now, uh, international labor law really isn't very international at all. Um, uh, uh, it was born when the majority of states uh, 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 didn't even, uh, presently in the international order, didn't actually exist. Many were still colonies. Um, many, like China, weren't recognized as peers in the international order. Um, uh, and they didn't have equal status to influence the regimes that were devised. Um, and this kind of historical moment and contingency has turned out to be incredibly significant. Um, uh, highly consequential for the form and content of labor law. Um, here's why. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, the first thing that happened was the kind of uh, uh, institution of a division between workers in the north and workers in the south. Uh, uh, with a few exceptions, the familiar problems of labor law in the North and in Europe, really, and, and, and America, set the agenda for international labor law. And the ILO itself was organized around the constituencies and the actors that mattered in that world, namely unions, employers, associations, and states. Um, and and 
problems of work were just large in the global south were largely defined out of the agenda of labor of international labor law. They were they were imagined as problems of development, um, uh, things that would get would get solved as as countries modernized, um, as economies industrialized, and as productivity increased. Right. Okay. Um, so the employment relationship became the normative and institutional center of international labor law, uh, and other types of work, subsistence work, informal work, care work, um, uh, petty on account self-employment, um, frankly the, the work that most people in the world actually did was um, uh, 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 exceptionalized or ignored. So I want to put it to you that part of the task of labor law going forward in the next century, so it's just about 100 years old, in fact it's exactly 100 years old right now, it's it being 2019, a part of the task of international law is actually to become truly international law, international, uh, and to take more seriously um, uh, the various situations and needs and demands of the many, many workers that it has up to this point not focused on. Um, uh, um, um, and paradoxically, I think this task will be aided because the distinctions between work and workers in the North and South is itself breaking down. I won't say more about this, but one of the things that we're discovering is that informal work is actually growing in industrialized economies as well. It used to be thought that it would disappear. That's no longer true. Okay. So, um, that's, this is old international labor law. You now have at least a thumbnail sketch of what it looks like, what it was organized around. Um, labor law has, in some senses, already shifted. Um, and I'm going to contrast the sort of old world of labor law um, uh, with another one as a way of sketching out what I think um, the future of labor, uh, international labor law will look like and as a way of identifying um, the salient sort of features that will define it. Um, and I, I'm going to suggest in line with my title that it's best described as the transnational governance of work. Um, and each of these terms, transnational governance and work, I think signposts a significant change in the field. Um, uh, so let me say um, transnational. Uh, so efforts to secure better working conditions at the global level are no longer um, exclusively or even primarily directed at nation states, and they don't, for the most part, take the familiar form of interstate treaties, covenants, and conventions. Right? Instead, rules at work are authored by um, a, a large and growing array of public, private, and increasingly hybrid actors, uh, many of whom traverse borders. Um, and their actions are um, uh, very often bypass states entirely. They're directed at firms and at industries. Um, and these actors range from multinational corporations um, um, and global value and supply chains, uh, networks of firms um, that are engaged in cross-border production, um, and NGOs, of course, and industry organizations. Um, uh, 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 that go well beyond the ILO. And I uh, want to suggest that their activities are best understood in terms of governance rather than law. Um, so the term governance is a kind of umbrella term that many people now use. Uh, on the one hand, to capture a diverse array of activities and endeavors that might loosely be called regulatory in the sense that they're intended to and they actually do direct and affect conduct at work and in many other places. Um, and uh, um, the term also signals a break um, from classic modes of lawmaking, um, uh, namely the production of norms, rules, and institutions by state, by state actors. Um, that possess the authority, the legitimacy, um, and the capacity to regulate social and economic activity. Okay? So think of governance as encompassing law, but going well beyond it, right? Um, uh, uh, it includes intentional state-based efforts to establish workplace standards and rights uh, through familiar political and adjudicative channel channels, what we typically call command and control regulation. 
Um, uh, but it also includes many, many other open, decentralized, iterative, reflexive modes of lawmaking and standard setting. So these are industry codes of conduct, um, uh, best practice labor standards, um, and labor market governance uh, practices that are generated by everybody from human resource managers within firms to technocrats at the international economic and financial institutions. Um, and they include, I think, rule of law and empowerment initiatives, often directed at workers, at women and informal workers. Um, and I would also include things like metrics and indicators um, that are designed to uh, induce states to reform their regulatory structures, usually in conformity with best practice um, uh, governance norms as established by the institutions that create these metrics. Um, so I'm thinking of things like the World Bank's Doing Business Indicator Series, um, uh, but uh, anybody who works in the world of human rights will be familiar with a proliferation of metrics and indicators that, that just measure everything. There are all kinds of measures of labor market, good labor market governance too. Um, they are also part of how we regulate work and how we also change labor and employment law right now. Okay? It's a much, much bigger universe. This is part of what's going on in the world of work. And it's much more important, in my estimation, having watched this for over 20 years, um, it can be as uh, much more important as anything that is or isn't going on at um, uh, the level of state-based law. But in any event, whatever is going on at state-based law is often in close conversation with these broader developments. OK, and finally work. Um, uh, the object of interest, as I've suggested already, um, is no longer uh, employment simpliciter or even waged labor, as we conventionally know it, but simply the broader category of work. If we're really interested in um, uh, uh, the uh, objective of decent work for all, which is how the ILO often describes its mission, um, uh, then international labor law or the transnational governance of work has to encompass a much, much broader category of work um, than it has in the past. So these are the many workers who have no fixed employment relationship. Um, uh, this is a category that's growing in the industrialized work and, and has always included most workers um, outside of the industrialized world. Um, uh, um, um, uh, those who work in informal work markets and people who work outside of markets together, um, those who are involved in subsistence work, um, they basically catch or grow um, or um, uh, they farm for themselves, they fish for themselves, they may engage in a little bit of um, barter or petty trade or commerce, but a huge amount of what they do is designed to simply uh, service themselves, their families, and maybe the immediate community. Right? Okay. Um, Oh, there's a clock. Excellent. Okay. Um, there are a bunch of really important interconnected changes behind this um, that I'm going to just briefly summarize because I am going to run out of time, I'm sure, pretty quickly. One is simply globalization. This is much greater mobility on the part of capital um, uh, than uh, workers typically enjoy. This has profoundly changed the power between firms and workers. Uh, it means workers are in competition with a much larger group of workers than they ever were before for work. Um, uh, um, and uh, um, so this is a critical part of the changing landscape. The second one, this matters a lot, is the rise of networked production and supply chain work. Okay, so um, instead of production being organized uh, and work being performed inside of firms, much global production and even domestic production now is organized in networks of um, suppliers who are linked by contract. Um, um, and among the consequences has been the decline of full-time work with regular, relatively regular hours and working conditions and the rise of uh, various forms of precarious and contingent forms of work, uh, contract work, zero hours contract work, which is a big thing in the UK right now. Um, 
uh, um, lots of um, uh, um, imposed self-employment, contract work or self-employment that workers uh, must engage in because their because uh, their firms won't hire them as employees anymore, and the 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 uh, net result is um, uh, really low levels of job security and economic security across the board. Okay, um, and this is one of the reasons that there's a massive misfit between the actual world of work and labor law as we know it. There are all kinds of workers who just aren't adequately captured and covered by those, uh, by, by employment rules and standards, simply because the basic question of legal classification arises, are these people employees and thus entitled to be protected by labor standards, or are they in law independent contractors, which means all they have available by way of contractual remedies are the normal commercial remedies um, that govern other entrepreneurs and firms and so forth, right? It makes a huge difference. It makes all the difference in the world whether you get in the gateway at all. And more and more workers never even, as a question of legal classification, even make it through the gateway into the world of labor and employment law. Okay, um, another big part of the story is the rise of um, uh, new global governance uh, norms. Uh, workers' rights and labor market regulation everywhere has been really deeply impacted by um, the dominant ethos of regulation of our time. Um, you, we all know it, um, sometimes referred to as market fundamentalism or uh, neoliberalism. Um, uh, uh, basically, we know what the traditional image or uh, uh, or mandate of labor law, both domestic and international was. It's to put a floor under working conditions. It's to enable workers to aggregate their bargaining power uh, in order to bid up wages and working conditions, um, uh, to recognize basic associational rights and so forth. Um, this whole agenda, this whole mandate is being challenged by um, uh, um, uh, policy, uh, regulatory initiatives, and narratives and theory coming out of um, the institutions um, uh, charged with economic governance um, um, uh, who emphasize a very, very different set of regulatory norms and aspirations, namely um, uh, greater efficiency, greater productivity, um, and uh, competition, right? And uh, they have become deeply engaged in questions of labor market governance uh, on the theory that uh, uh, workers' rights and, and employment standards can have a negative as well as a positive impact on these objectives of uh, efficiency, productivity, and growth, right? And so um, they largely accept very basic works uh, rights for workers. Um, but they figure higher labor standards and particularly unions and collective action on the part of workers as part of the problem. So they're hostile, if I can be really blunt about it, they're hostile to a lot of the traditional aspirations and agenda for workers' rights. Um, so one of the consequences is that the ILO is, is now in kind of open competition with other international uh, uh, institutions over the agenda for workers' rights. Um, and they're not winning a lot of the time. They're losing a lot of the time. Um, uh, so let me just pause for a moment and try and sum up, I think, two big takeaways from the story as I've sketched it so far. Um, there are kind of two interrelated challenges that anybody who's interested in workers' rights and labor market governance faces right now. Um, uh, and one is the challenge of institutional conflict and competition over workers' rights and um, uh, labor market regulation. Like, what are we trying to do? Who should have what rights, right? Um, uh, what is labor law for? Um, and um, uh, what does it mean? Uh, uh, if there's been a deep challenge to the idea of what labor law is even for, we shouldn't be surprised that there are all kinds of knock-on effects on labor rights and labor market institutions at the mid-level and the grassroots level. And that's exactly what we see all the way down. Um, the second one is in this world of competition and conflict among regimes for labor market governance um, uh, is the challenge of managing normative pluralism right, um, and multi-level forms of governance. What do you do when there are multiple agendas in circulation 
uh, all of which are relevant to workers' rights. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, one of the most familiar forms of conflict or one of the places in which the conflict between workers and other types of rights is most frequently staged. Um, and that is in respect of trade or trade and labor standards. Um, 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 since the intensification of cross-border trade began, let's say roughly speaking in the 1970s, um, and the creation of the WTO in particular in the mid-1990s, um, uh, workers advocates and industrialized states like the US in particular have sought to link improvements um, in international labor standards to trade liberalization, right? Um, uh, the, uh, the underlying um, uh, uh, hope, I guess, of all of these efforts between, uh, behind linkage was to try and leverage the muscle provided by the enforcement mechanisms of trade regimes to strengthen international labor law, uh, norms, which were widely regarded as um, uh, 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 very weakly enforced. So the idea is linkage um, held the prospect of actually getting real, real material sanctions that would bite behind labor standards. Um, uh, but labor standards have always been contentious. They've been a source of conflict between North and South. Um, developing countries um, have worried that labor standards could be used and would be used as latent forms of protectionism, um, uh, uh, ways to impair uh, reliance on low-wage uh, labor, which is such an important competitive advantage of all developing countries. It's been critical to the Industrial Revolution of China, for example, but also in India, Bangladesh, and elsewhere. Um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, so trade linkage, explicit linkages between labor standards and trade agreements um, got frustrated pretty directly. Um, uh, the WTO uh, uh, ruled very, very early on um, uh, that it wouldn't sanction uh, uh, this linkage and it said, no, if you're worried about labor standards, go back to the ILO. The ILO is the proper organization to deal with these things. Um, uh, uh, and the short story is that the ILO responded with um, uh, a document or a declaration that many of you may know of. Um, um, it's the ILO Declaration on Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work of 1998 that laid out four basic core labor rights or standards. And the idea was that they would provide a kind of baseline standard on the theory that all states, all actors, in fact, could agree to them um, without in any way impairing their competitive advantage. Um, and, and they are freedom of association and the effective right to bargain collectively and freedom from discrimination, child labor, child labor and forced labor. Um, uh, these are very, very widely adopted, circulated. They've been taken up in a, a large number of arenas. Um, um, and uh, um, uh, one of the first places that you'll see them now is actually in trade and investment agreements because despite the sort of explicit rejection, um, what you find out is that trade and labor standards are now pretty routinely in included in bilateral trade and investment agreements and in the big mega regional in agreements like the comprehensive um, uh, um, and progressive trade um, uh, agreement that's been signed, um, the CP CPTPP uh, recently. Okay, uh, now notwithstanding the linkage, um, uh, I've got a pretty dark view of um, uh, the possibilities of using trade-related labor um, adjudication to improve uh, um, standards. Um, I don't think much is gonna happen um, uh, uh, in a progressive way um, in respect of um, uh, this kind of litigation in the future. Um, I'm going to just maybe by way of justifying that, I'll just briefly refer to a couple of things that have happened. A couple, there aren't very many cases in which uh, labor rights have been litigated. Uh, in fact, the very first um, case on labor standards in connection to a trade and investment regime was only handed down last summer, the U.S. Guatemala case um, out of the U.S. Um, Central American Free Trade Agreement. 
Uh, but there have been a couple of cases um, that the European Court of Justice has um, heard that involved a conflict between workers' rights and the rights of establishment um, in the European Union, namely the right of businesses to set up uh, businesses in states other than their home countries. And in both of these forums, um, uh, there has been a very, very basic uh, problem, and that is that the tribunals um, have either decided that workers' rights have to be carved back in ways uh, that ensure that they don't impair the rights of businesses to set up establishments in other countries. Um, um, that's what's happened in the EU at the European Court of Justice, um, if not at the European Court of Human Rights. Um, uh, and in the one case in which uh, workers' rights were heard by a trade and investment tribunal, uh, um, the problem uh, uh, is, I think, we saw we had a sort of textbook illustration of the reason that you have specialized labor courts. <laughs> um, um, what the trade, um, the tribunal that heard this dispute did was throw out um, or discount all kinds of evidence that is critical to both uh, not just establishing labor rights violations, but understanding what they look like and how they operate in particular contexts. Um, so if I can just describe briefly what happened. Um, 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 when the US um, submitted the complaint in the Guatemala case, it redacted the names of the workers that were behind the complaint. Now, anybody who works in the field of labor rights knows why they did that. Why did they do that? Well, it's so that the workers wouldn't be subject to reprisals, which in this case might well be murder. The union organizers get murdered um, in some countries. Um, uh, but the tribunal said, oh, well, that just lessens the probative value of this evidence, right? Um, they also threw out a bunch of uh, reports by the ILO and trade unions about general conditions um, in the industries, um, and they failed to take account of the fact that when you um, suppress union organization organizing in one plant, you can expect to see knock-on effects in other um, uh, in other firms and other industries. Put simply, the damage or the injury isn't confined to a single workplace. It has a chilling effect on organizing generally. This is something that all labor courts, all labor arbitrators, all judges, judges know everywhere. It's one of the reasons why you, you know, they just take it as understood. So, uh, but of course, um, uh, people who don't know anything about labor disputes don't know this, and so. Um, with these kinds of strictures, there's very, very little um, chance, I think, um, uh, that, uh, that labor complaints will actually succeed. And the thing that actually really put the nail in the coffin at the end of the day was um, uh, uh, the fact that the tribunal thought that the U.S. Um, hadn't sufficiently established that um, the uh, firms that engaged in what they recognized were violations of workers' rights had actually obtained a trade advantage by doing so. Namely, they weren't prepared to take it as given that, you know, they don't necessarily suppress union organizing or murder organizers just because they're sadistic. They do it for commercial purposes. They do it because it keeps wages low, it keeps workforces compliant, and, you know, Anyway, they weren't prepared to assume any kind of trade-related advantage. Um, anyway, um, I, I think that one of the things that you can see um, in these cases, very clearly illustrated, um, apart from the problems I just described, is our real conflict and competition among norms. And going forward, the fate of workers' rights is going to matter, it's going to fall, really, on where the complaint is heard. Um, um, and that's because, as the International Law Commission uh, 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 observed in its big report on the fragmentation of international law, every regime has its biases and its systemic perspectives. You know, if you bring your complaint before a human rights tribunal, you can expect to get a better, more sympathetic hearing in general of a workers' rights claim than you will before a tribunal who understands its mission to oversee the seamless operation of trade across borders, right? And 
Um, so this is part of the landscape going forward. Um, it's going to matter a great deal what regime um, uh, uh, hears the complaints. Um, um, I'm going to leave aside um, more detail on the nature of the disputes about labor market governance that are going on in other arenas in the international order right now. I, but I do want to just say I think that there's a huge battle to be conducted to recover um, uh, the idea that labor standards are not your enemy, they're your friend. Um, uh, uh, at least they may well be. Um, uh, the economic arguments against labor standards are um, uh, 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 much more fragile um, than they appear, and there's an enormous amount of abuse of economic theory going on um, in the arguments against labor standards. We don't have time to talk about that today, but I think everybody who works in this field needs to know and needs to refuse to accept the argument that labor rights and labor standards are necessarily impediments to efficiency and productivity. There's both theory and evidence suggesting that the, that the relationship operates as uh, frequently in the other direction as it does in that one. So let's just put that aside for the moment. Um, um, uh, I do want to say a few minutes, uh, uh, a few words about what's going on um, in all of the efforts to work around the state um, uh, uh, to improve labor market standards um, and why they're both promising and worrying at the same time. Um, uh, so the origins of these non-state efforts align with NGOs and civil society groups, um, sometimes working in conjunction with unions, who uh, uh, using the sort of political discursive, uh, political space and discursive power of human rights very frequently, have very successfully drawn attention to labor rights violations in many work sites and, and locales, right? And so this has produced a bunch of very interesting responses. Um, uh, and one is an effort to manage harms to their reputation on the part of big transnational brands um, uh, by um, codes of conduct, uh, factory disclosures, uh, monitoring of workplace and con uh, conditions. Um, another is an effort to deflect efforts to raise workplace standards uh, in the conventional way, namely by, by raising national standards, enforceable standards. Um, they're trying to head off into enforceable standards by proliferating all kinds of things like um, the UN Global Compact, which is a platform for learning, and they say, no, 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 you don't want hard standards, you just want to disseminate better workplace standards through peer learning and you know, uh, peer monitoring. That's very, very popular. Um, and out of these, there's yet a third generation of public-private initiatives, which are very interesting amalgams in which um, uh, both the ILO and various UN um, and other international organizations are partnering with uh, civil society groups, um, typically to try and get some kind of response out of um, uh, um, the business community. But um, I think what's really interesting is that many of these initiatives, in part because of the power of private actors in setting the agenda, are framed not in terms of basic rights, but as empowerment initiatives, right? So all these things, there are all kinds of initiatives to empower the poor and empower women simply by setting them up to be more effective commercial actors on the theory that this is how you're really going to make life better for them. So there's a, this is a massively powerful and well-backed paradigm uh, for improving social justice through market instruments. Hugely interesting, really controversial, um, uh, but very, very powerful. Anybody working in the field should expect to have to, should expect to encounter these things and should expect to have to engage arguments about why they might not be a panacea to all the problems at work because they have a huge amount of power and steam and money behind them. Okay, so the bottom line is that um, um, we, we're, we're in a really complex environment um, in which there's this intermingling of public and private actors. There are different agendas. Um, the economic agenda is now completely merged in many places with social rights and social justice concerns. Um, uh, I remain worried about many dimensions of this. Um, uh, the rights of workers and firms remain distinctly asymmetrical. 
Um, I don't think we should deeply uh, we should be at all surprised when uh, firms are running the um, labor standards agenda that they choose to do so in ways that are least disruptive to their own commercial and corporate purposes. We should expect them to do that, and that is what they do for the most part. Um, 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 so. Um, uh, you can see firms and NGOs picking up um, some international, um, uh, and the ILO declaration as being, being the first one and the most important one. But I, I, I would describe um, big projects of realignment and redescription. Um, the effort to, de to redescribe the mission and purpose of labor law um, in ways that make it much more uh, harmonious to the interests of business and ways that read out the complex conflicts that have always been behind efforts to raise labor standards. Um, so let me stop here um, and say that I think there are just four issues that both should and will take um, center stage in uh, um, the agenda um, uh, going forward. Uh, informal work, uh, transnational supply chain governance, huge issues here, extremely interesting in China but elsewhere. Um, uh, the problem of care work, um, uh, uh, namely unpaid work that's done by people, namely women mostly, who are now in the labor force. Um, the feminization of the labor force means that we can't ignore care work anymore. And finally, um, the plight of migrant workers who in every jurisdiction always labor under conditions that are inferior to those of domestic workers. Anyway, thank you so much uh, for listening. Thank you very much, Carrie. Um, we still have some time for questions and discussion. <coughs> yes? Yeah, uh, Professor, uh, I want to raise two questions. Now, number one on transnational governance. Yeah. Uh, unless the ILO cooperates with the United Nations on how to achieve uh, sustainable development goals like uh, social justice, yep. I don't see how uh, this you know, <coughs> aspect of transnational governance can be imposed upon states. Because, uh, say, take a look at the uh, UN Convention on Transnational Organized Crime. At mm -hmm. least the UN takes the initiative to define the parameters of uh, organized crime and then stays to take action accordingly. Mm -hmm. Now, on uh, other issues like uh, you know, good governance and anti-corruption, the Trans Transparency International took a very important step to come up with indicators, as you mentioned, indicators are important. Indicators to measure all these uh, you know, corruption indexes all over the world, and then stays take action. Yeah. Now, on the labor issue, uh, unless the ILO really cooperates with the UN or World Bank yep. or IMF. I don't see that kind of top-down pressure on the states. That's number one. And number two, when you mention the concept of work, this is culturally sensitive because take a look at the South in the developing world, sex work. Sex work is very controversial in the South. Even in this part of Greater China, China doesn't have any law governing sex work. In Hong Kong, we have an interest group fighting for the interests of the sex workers, yep. but not even Taiwan. And Macau is even worse. So, when you mention the concept of work, you talk about care work, informal work, and that's very good. But when we use this concept of work in, in the southern part of the developing countries, it's very controversial, especially yep. we, we are touching on cultural sensitivities here. So, I'm not so sure whether this concept of work can be applicable to countries in the South. Rather, maybe labor relations can be a more neutral concept for the countries in the South, because the concept of work here is, is extremely different in between the North and the South. So that's, that's my observations and questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let me start with your first one. The idea that the ILO needs to work with other international institutions like the World Bank or um, uh, the International oh, yeah. Monetary Fund and so forth, if, if, if it's to be effective at all, if I'm understanding yeah. it correctly. Okay, so first thing to observe is that the ILO in fact does work with these um, organizations and the International Finance Corporation, for example, the private sector funding um, uh, uh, arm of the, of the uh, World Bank does in fact use various ILO standards 
in its work. But I'm going to flip your question around. Um, the problem is not that the ILO doesn't work with these groups. The problem is what the IMF and the World Bank think is good labor market governance. And let me give you an example. Okay, so in, their, in its doing business project, in which the World Bank purports to measure regulatory quality, it had, has all these different categories that rank countries in terms of the quality of their regulation. One of the original indicators on that project was a hiring workers indicator. Okay, now how do you get a high score on the hiring workers indicator of the World Bank? By having low labor standards, right? So, I mean, that was extremely controversial, right? Um, uh, the trade unions correctly observed that it was an open invitation to all states to both lower their labor standards and violate their international law commitments, right? So this metric has in fact been withdrawn, but what hasn't been withdrawn is the general suspicion on the part of the World Bank and the IMF that labor standards constitute an impediment to economic growth and um, should be loosened, right? So the problem, I would say, is not in the direction that you've suggested, but rather in the other one. I think the task is to get the World Bank and the IMF to rethink their commitment to flexible labor standards. And in fact, there's some, I mean, they, they sometimes are moving in this direction, but I think that is actually the big battle at the international level. And if we could crack that nut, we'd be in much better shape. Okay. Um, and on your second question, um, work as culturally sensitive. Um, you are completely right about work being culturally sensitive in the sense that how we organize work is really inseparable from larger social structures and larger social and cultural norms. That is absolutely true. It's absolutely true. Um, and that's why I think it matters a lot what you do in the world of workplace regulation. The reason that I was advocating that we think about the larger universe of work rather than simply labor standards was, is twofold. One, so that frankly we can care about more workers, not only the people in the standard employment relationship, right? Um, there are tons of norms and rules and standards uh, uh, concerning their work. We need much, much more attention to many other forms of work which have been neglected, but they're the forms of work that many people do. I mean, I think even labor lawyers need persuading on this. Um, uh, um, I'm making a bit of an outlier argument here, but I'm sure that I'm right. I'm sure that I'm right. How can you pretend to care about workers if you ignore most workers? <laughs> I mean, it's basic. Um, now, uh, the specific example that you gave in respect of sex work is a really interesting one. Um, and it's a very good one to think about because um, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, trafficking and sex work is actually regulated under the trafficking protocol of the UN Convention on Organized Crime, the very, the very law that you mentioned. But there is a really big debate about whether that legal instrument and the criminal law prohibitions, which are the major instrument for addressing trafficking and sex work, are a good way to regulate this problem, and in particular, whether they assist the workers themselves. And there are, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that in fact, if you imagine sex work as a particular type of work, and you look at it through the lens of labor law, then um, it's actually easier to see things that you can do that will assist the workers than if you supply a criminal law, um, uh, uh, simply attach the criminal law um, uh, um, uh, to the problem. Um, and it's got other problems as well. Um, um, there's, a, there, there's a wonderful Artic uh, a wonderful article that was written on trafficking about 10 years ago by a scholar um, called Janie Chuang, a Chinese-American scholar, on the problem of trafficking. It's, and, and she calls the U.S. the global sheriff when it comes to trafficking. And uh, her point in this article was to say 
that actually the international convention matters much less than the U.S. domestic law on trafficking. Why? Because the U.S. has a law on trafficking that ranks countries according to the extent to which they do or do not criminalize trafficking and sex work. And if you get badly ranked in the U.S.'s internal ranking, then you, country, let's say Thailand or whatever, you're subject to all kinds of economic sanctions, right? So what do you think happens? Well, countries are all of a sudden changing their domestic laws on sex work to bring them into conformity with a U.S. law that criminalizes trafficking and imposes all kinds of things that actually don't assist the workers very much um, because they're scared of all the economic penalties that the U.S. is in a position to impose on them, including denying them market access for all their goods, right? So one of the reasons I think it's interesting to think about this is that you've got a formal international law that purports to regulate this. It turns out it's not actually the law that's regulating it. It turns out it's some U.S. domestic law that's regulating everybody. Um, and, but there's problems with both of those regimes, namely they both use criminal law, and it's really not at all clear that the criminal law is the best way to solve problems at work. There are other ways. And there are things that you might want to do differently that would help the workers more. And so the argument is, think about it through the lens of labor law, you'll come up with some other solutions, at least some of them will help the workers. I think, I think that the position is relatively neutral on the cultural question about sex work and other forms of work. It's, it, it's, it's a more a practical lens. Like if, we, if our interest is, is actually assisting the workers, what's the best way to go, go about doing that? Thank you. Um, one more question, I guess, if that's okay with you. <laughs> Sorry, that was a long answer. <laughs> I'll try to keep this really short. Um, I want to ask you about the problem of enforcement, and especially as these issues move from the space of national laws yeah. toward individual companies making yep. a set of standards. Yep. And then the question is, well, do they stop then when they say we have these you know, best practices you know, for our suppliers or for the people yep. that we interact with? Are they done? Yeah. And I think all of us would agree the answer is no, but then you know, how do they make sure, especially if it's in an industry where you don't have a lot of uh, public visibility? So you know, on that side, I see you know, more and more attention is being paid, especially to the garment industry, for example. Yep. But other industries like construction, or, yep. and that, that was my experience in the construction industry. Um, you know, oftentimes, you have lots of sub sub subcontractors sub, with sub, very sub, sub. little um, yes. insight into yeah. practices. Uh, being implemented by those yeah. uh, companies, yeah. and so, and then oftentimes, if you discover an abuse by a sub 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 contractor, you know, then what happens? Do you sever the contract? Oftentimes, that can also be uh, a detrimental to the workers yeah. who are then not going yeah. to have employment. So, you know, well, what do these companies do, um, and how do we make sure that this is not just a purely uh, economic consideration? Um, and if I can add a, just a side question to that, is how do companies? incorporate into their procurement practices the additional costs of compliance and make sure that um, can somehow be treated differently. So if a company is competing for a contract with a, with a larger kind of company in the supply chain, you know, and it costs them more because they're paying higher worker yeah. worker salaries or other benefits to workers, that company is going to look more expensive yeah. and somewhat similar to a company that maybe just isn't as efficient but isn't providing better services yeah. or benefits to workers and how do you make sure that you give um, preference to the company that's putting that extra cost toward the workers. Okay. Sorry. We were, no, it's, uh, we were talking about this a little bit at lunch. So first, I think this is one of the biggest problems. And um, you have put your finger on it. You described the well, the problem, and the, the sort of uh, structure. Um, basically, uh, you have to find ways to reallocate uh, both legal responsibilities and power up and down the supply chain, right? Namely, you have to make the lead firms responsible for violations that occur way down um, uh, uh, at the bottom of the supply chain. Um, and you have to reallocate the bargaining power among the players because um, you described exactly what happens. Uh, supply chains are designed to pit firms in competition with each other to deliver the good at the lowest possible price. 
in labor intensive industries, the only way that you can do that is by undercutting wages and working conditions. It's a machine for producing labor market violations. That's what it is. It's what it's designed to do. So basically you have to redesign the machine. Um, it's, uh, um, and um, so you know the sub, 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 what links all these parties is a bilateral contract. And as all of you know from contract law, contract binds only the two parties who are the party to the contract. So it is the device by which risks and costs are externalized by those higher up in the contract and imposed on those lower down. You just need legal devices that don't permit that particular legal structure to operate anymore. There's a bunch of ways to do it. But um, let me just give you one example that already exists in many countries in the construction industry. And that is liens that make um, uh, lead firms responsible for the debts of the subcontractors if they go out of business. Though a really frequent thing happens is you'll have a firm or, or, or corporations that that's um, um, uh, created for, the, for a particular project, right? It goes out of business or dissolves without paying the wages of the workers, right? So in this kind of situation, um, uh, the higher ups are responsible for the unpaid wages, right? Basic idea, there are legal devices to make the parties responsible, higher up, and that's what has to happen. There are complexities because it now crosses borders, right? So there's questions about um, the, trend, the extraterritorial effect of labor standards. The general rule in most jurisdictions is that um, uh, they don't have extraterritorial effects. I think we have to revisit that rule. If we allow a firm to select the contract law that's going to govern its contract, as we do, then uh, why, why does it get to select the contract law that's most favorable and then deselect the labor law? I mean, that's a fixable problem. It's a problem of political will. But it's not a problem that's insoluble at the end of the day through legal technology. But I think, I think the issue is you really do have to focus on the legal structure through which parties organize their commercial relations and um, uh, um, work at that level. Um, the, the best example, the classic example, is Apple and Foxconn. Uh, Apple is the most commercially successful firm, I think, in human history. I mean, it makes, it makes uh, uh, profits of unimaginable magnitude, but as we know, you know, Foxconn workers were literally committing suicide. Their working conditions were so dire, right? It's not a problem of enough money to pay them. There's enough money. The problem is that the folks at Apple headquarters are capturing it all. We need to, we need to reorganize the, the legal relationships so uh, that um, either responsibility is directly imposed for some of these things or simply that the firms below um, have more bargaining power to resist um, the pressure. But the, the problem is the model itself. The model itself is a machine for producing labor rights violations. It, and it's designed to do that. That's why firms outsource. They uh, outsource their labor to pay less, right? And, uh, but there, there are ways to fix it. It's a really interesting legal puzzle and I think it's one of the most important ones to work on. And no, it won't be solved by corporate social responsibility. That's a, that's a total distraction. Okay, I think we, we really are officially <laughs> officially out of time now, but I, I just want to thank you very much for that um, comprehensive, incredibly rich overview of international labor law from the origins to the um, challenges <laughs> that we're facing now, um, what's missing, what's new, um, and and a research agenda, I think, which you've just, which you've just set out. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're big pieces. Uh, they're, they're great projects for all of us to work on. So people should all be working on pieces of it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, thank, thank you. you. Very much. Thank you.